Meyer versus Jackson Lee. As the clock winds down on the runoff campaign, the mayoral contenders took the stage, pitching both their capabilities and their vision for Houston's future. With just days remaining in his eight-year term, the outgoing mayor compelled to defend his legacy amid new revelations of corruption and favoritism. And Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo under legal scrutiny yet again after recklessly campaigning for a fellow Democrat on the taxpayer's dime. I'm Greg Grugan and welcome to Watch Your Point where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, Houston attorney and conservative commentator Gary Polland. Next up, longtime super neighborhood leader Tamaro Bell. In the three spot, well known businessman and columnist for Real Clear Politics, Bill King. Batting cleanup today, Holly Hansen, political writer for The Texan. And closing us out, public safety and education advocate, Paul Castro. Let's begin. We have to let non violent individuals know that there is a second chance for them. And we got to let the violent offenders know we're coming after you if you put a gun in somebody's face. Target the high risk areas. Be able to put in neighborhood storefronts. Work with businesses to provide the funding for that. Get the federal dollars, real federal dollars. The finalists in the race to be Houston's next mayor squaring off in a head-to-head -head Fox 26 debate aimed at voters responsible for deciding who will best lead the nation's fourth largest city over the next four years. Amid multiple allegations of pay-to-play contracting and corruption within the current administration, both candidates pledged a new era of financial transparency if elected. That one dark light will be over any contract. The public will know, city council will know, we'll work on it together. There will be changes at City Hall. It will be transparency. There will not be conflicts of interest as we currently witness. There you have it, an equivalent promise. Panel, the question now, who do Houston voters believe will actually deliver on crime control and eradicating corruption? Uh, there were some other promises made in that debate. Bill, you wrote about it. Yeah, but I'm not sure there's many persuadable people left in this election right now, so I'm not sure how much difference these debates mean at this point. But the thing that I thought was interesting, the first time Whitmire said he was going to suspend the automatic water rate increases, which is something I've been advocating for for some time, because water rates are up 50% over the last three years, just the rates themselves. And the, the, the water sewer fund is now sitting on about a $2 billion surplus. It's not clear that we need rates at this kind of increase going forward. And so I was glad to see him do that. Did you hear anything equivalent from uh, the Congresswoman? I did not. What was the Congresswoman's strength in this debate tomorrow? Uh, the Congresswoman's strength in this bank was that she let people know. She knows where the financial uh, money is to help the city get on the right ground. You see the trillion dollar bipartisan infrastructure bill that passed in, in, in Washington. We can access that money and update our much needed infrastructure rebuild. You have people in Fifth Ward who under past administrations any administration and this administration can't even drink our water out their faucet. So she knows that the whole water system needs to be overhauled. All right, Gary, some might hear that and say, well, so we're going to access federally borrowed dollars to pay mm -hmm. our debts. That grants. Well, uh, actually, we're 33 trillion in debt, and the, all this money that came in this new program is more money we're going to issue debt for. So there is no money. It's a joke. In fact, the financial crisis facing America is quite serious. And you go back to the city of Houston. Uh, I, I heard Sheila say she's going to access federal dollars. Well, maybe and maybe not. I mean, we, what we have to do is be smarter about how we spend the money we have here. I mean, the city of Houston has plenty of revenue. It's how we spend it. That's the big question. It's not efficient, it's not effective, and the water system, as Bill knows, has been neglected for 30 years, including the last eight years of Sylvester Turner. All right, Paul Castro, I know you were listening with a keen ear on, on what these candidates have offered in terms of improving public safety. 
uh, you, you've got skin in that game. Yeah, I think one of the things that people I talked to were excited to hear is that both candidates are talking about public safety for the issue that it is. No one is trying to say, oh, don't believe the data, don't believe your feelings, don't believe what you're seeing with your friends and neighbors. Both are committed to trying to make the city better. I also know that Personally, I was able to watch Senator Whitmire come to Houston, work and advocate on behalf of bail bond reform to the Harris County Bail Bond Board, and through his efforts, turn something into a win for the city. And so for that, I'm grateful. And, and having seen that with my own eyes, uh, I, I'm excited about his possible leadership as our future mayor. Holly, any takeaways from this debate? Well, to Bill's point, I think that uh, not a lot of people need to be persuaded at this point, but they do need to be persuaded to go to the polls because voter turnout was incredibly low in the initial round, uh, lower than it was in 2019 when, when Bill ran. Um, and we're expecting a voter turnout that may be, you know, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. So if people feel strongly about what they believe should be the case in Houston, they need to get out to the polls. We have two public polls that have this rate somewhere between seven and eight. You've been critical of the polls tomorrow. Do you think that's they're inaccurate? I absolutely think that they're inaccurate. Uh, there was a poll done here at Fox and uh, in that poll that was done here, Sheila won 60 percent to 40 percent out of 1,044 people. And some of these public polls, as we said on this show, they were polls that only had 198 people. That's not something I think you should uh, release. Well, I think we need to make it clear here that the, our little poll is an unscientific poll, Correct. not conducted by political scientists right. with PhDs. Exactly. As the one that I'm talking about was conducted by PhD researchers, but it was only 198 people during the uh, Hidalgo Ooh. and the Alex Miller. And when we found that data out, they said, well, we couldn't get a lot of people to respond. I don't think you should release 198 people in a city of 2 million. All right, Bill, any thoughts there? Well, I know the, two, the U of H poll I saw had, I think, 500 and some odd respondents, which is what you have to get to get a statistically significant sample based on the number of people that vote in this election. And, you know, I have to say Mark Jones polling on the first race was dead on. I mean, it was almost exactly what he said it was going to be. So, you know, look, polls are polls. This is really about turnout and who's going to come back to vote. So far in early voting, I would say it's advantage Whitmire because the suburbs are turning out more than the African-American neighborhoods are so far. Gary, you've covered many elections. I mean, you know, do people, do polls push uh, additional turnout or, or, or addition or, or, or gather or track votes? I think in the, I think the answer is yes and no. In this race, we're, uh, we're pretty close to within the margin of error of the polls. So it'll motivate, in this case, Sheila Jackson Lee supporters to go out if they think their candidate is behind, but within striking distance. By the same token, it should motivate Whitmire voters to come out because this race could be lost if you don't vote. You agree with that, Holly? Absolutely. I think that, you know, when we look at those polls, the ones that came from U of H and some of the other more credible polling sites, um, we find that uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, unfortunately, is very polarizing. She has a really high negative, uh, unfavorable opinion uh, from from individuals who responded to the polls. Um, but it, it is going to come out down to turnout. And Sheila Jackson Lee's supporters are very devoted. They do tend to show up at the polls. So, you know, even though Whitmire is leading by most of the metrics, if his voters don't turn out, it will very well go to Sheila Jackson Lee. Real quickly, Bill. Uh, one significant thing, Bob Rehack up in Kingwood, who's the big flooding advocate, endorsed Whitmire uh, this last week, which is unusual. He doesn't normally endorse candidates. Jack Christie got about 20 or 30 percent of the vote, so that might help those folks decide to come vote again. Okay, we're going to okay. talk more about this. Still to come, Judge Lena Hidalgo using Harris County resources to campaign for her political allies and against her adversaries. Could she soon be facing charges? And in our Sunday survey, we are asking viewers if our state's public integrity laws are adequate as they are or need to be strengthened. Tell us what you think. Vote on our webpage, fox26houston.com. Just click on poll at the top of the page or tell 26 using our news app. But up next, Mayor Sylvester Turner on the counterattack after being accused of favoring African Americans for City Hall's top jobs at the expense of Latinos and Asians. But City Hall does not represent that diversity. Look at the department heads, pull them up, Google them. Look at who's running the city of Houston. It's not the Asian community. 
the Hispanic community is severely underrepresented. So let's practice what we're so proud of. It was yet another key moment in the Fox 26 mayoral debate when John Whitmire called out an ethnic imbalance among the city's senior leadership team, alleging Latinos and Asians had been shortchanged by Sylvester Turner to the distinct advantage of African Americans. Less than 48 hours later, the mayor fired back. To imply that there is no diversity and that's only one look, that's a dog whistle. Here are the hard numbers of the 22 city department heads on the website. 13 are African American, 5 are Caucasian, 4 are Latino, and none are Asian. Panel the simple math, black Houstonians comprise around 24% of the population, but nearly 60% of the current slate of department heads. All right, Paul, uh, Latinos in Houston represent something like 45% of the population, uh, not so much uh, in the uh, top jobs at City Hall. Yeah, I think uh, when people talk about the Hispanic community being disengaged, I think this would be an example of why they're disengaged and what they feel is separate from the power structure. So whether that power structure is traditionally Anglo, traditionally black, it's not been traditionally Hispanic. I think we have one city council member right now who's Hispanic. Um, HISD under the last administration, not this one, had one person at cabinet who was Hispanic in a district that's 70% Hispanic. Uh, so this is a pattern that has happened over time. I think what's really the key here is representation and people who understand the community. And so quite simply, if there are more people who are of a certain background and they are not represented, just as they may not be represented geographically, uh, it's important for any city, city leadership, organizational leadership, to try to bring those people in to have a better understanding of what's happening in the community. And I think that's what we're aspirationally moving towards. Tamara Bell, dog whistle, not a dog whistle. Dog whistle. Th uh, during Anise Parker's administration, she had 13 whites, she had seven blacks, and she had two Hispanics. Mm -hmm. Sylvester, when he started, <laughs> unfortunately, Anna Russell died. She was white. Uh, Tineo uh, was the finance, she was Asian. Acevedo left, he was Hispanic. Um, he had, uh, uh, unfortunately, Patrick Walsh died. But he had a literally uh, you couldn't get more multicultural and let's talk about the cabinet which y'all didn't mention at all and let's start with the person who said this I visited Senator Whitmire's office which nobody chose to talk about his staff I saw one black and the rest was all white now you want to talk about what diversity looked like that ain't how it look all right Bill uh, let's talk about brass tacks here was Whitmire talking to Asian and Latino voters some who may consider uh, not staying home and going to the polls was that uh, uh, I, sure, look, this has been a subtext that's been going on in Houston for a long time. It's really been fought out at HISD more so than the city of Houston. But there's a competition between the Hispanic community and the African American community for jobs and contracts and all that. And the Hispanic community has felt like they've been shortchanged for a long time. And so even though both of those groups tend to vote Democratic, there's a lot of tension and competition between them for these various um, things that government hands out. And so I think I think John was playing into that uh, competition and leaning into it in the debate. I know you and Gene Wu don't normally talk regularly. But <laughs> no, actually, actually, I do okay, talk okay, to okay. Yeah, court. So, so two days <laughs> after this, Gene Wu endorses Whitmire. Is coincidence? Uh, it might have been a connection, but what's <laughs> fascinating about this is this. It's not about the color of the person in this office, it's whether they're qualified right. and they're doing a good job. That's now, right. my criticism of Turner would be, I don't care what color these people are, they could be all black, all Hispanic, all Asian. Uh, representation's a good idea if you can get quality representation. But if you look at his department heads, it's one disaster after another. That's, that's the real issue. We're gonna talk about a disaster in the next block. <laughs> Up next, lucrative city water contracts steered to family and friends. The latest scandal to rock City Hall quite nearly cost Houston taxpayers millions. Welcome back, Houston Public Works and the city's Office of Inspector General. Now turning over every rock in pursuit of the so-called bad actors involved with handing out more than $8 million worth of water repair contracts to family members with pop-up businesses. 
Make no mistake, it is corruption neither the OIG or Public Works actually detected, but only came to light through the work of investigative journalist Amy Davis. Panel, uh, you all are keenly aware that when Davis asked Mayor Turner if he planned to cancel the fraudulent contracts, he threw a tantrum, calling her rude and promising to retaliate by calling her general manager. Bill, uh, what do you make of all this? Now the city's all on board and they're policing this thing. Well, kudos to Amy's and, and kudos to you for, you know, calling one of your competitors out and telling that they're doing a good Give job. I don't, I don't see that nearly That's enough in right. the Houston media. So thanks for doing that, Greg. Um, I've, I've been interviewed by Amy several times. She's really on this water issue and has been on it for a long time. Look, this is a structural problem. We have an extremely weak inspector general office in the city of Houston. It reports to the city attorney. This reports to the mayor. There needs to be an inspector general office that reports to city council. It needs to be part of the watchdog system. We need a good former prosecutor, uh, forensic accountant type person running that office and not some political appoint appointment. And they need to do their job because in, a, in an organization this big, you're always going to have these sort of things. And they need to work on and tightening up the internal controls and making sure we can't waste money. You just wonder how many other things are there down there like this Ooh. that we don't know about. Tomorrow, you know the ins and outs of procurement down there. Uh, what do you make of this? Uh, listen, I agree. Everybody pay attention. I agree with what Bill just said. I am an accountant, so I look at numbers. And when you have this massive amount of people, you've got to have a watchdog, sincere OIG that looks into it. Now, I can personally say that I reported a corruption in a contract, and I am not on anybody's reporter. And that person got fired the next day because I sent all the data that I had because I said, if y'all don't do it, my press conference will start at 9, and it will be in front of IAH Airport. So... They looked into it, but you cannot allow this to go undetected. You can't. You have got to have a OIG office that reports to council that is not afraid of getting fired for when they find some kind of things that are wrong. All right, legacy here. Just another example of things going wrong and money going the wrong way, Holly. Yes, it looks like the administration is constantly having to respond to these scandals. We've had numerous scandals. You know, we're still looking at what happened with the 800 Middle Street project where they're uh, planning to build a, quote, affordable housing on adjacent to land that's a Superfund site. And it's, it's clearly contaminated. Um, every time one of these scandals comes up, the administration says they didn't know about it. They're going to respond to it. But to Bill's point, you've got to have those safeguards in place before these things happen and I'd suggest it's not just the city of Houston we've got a lot of other governments that need closer scrutiny and we need to see what's happening with taxpayer dollars all right Gary 30 seconds of I told you so uh, yeah <laughs> I, I, I told you so look <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's fascinating I mean and I go back I've said it numerous times Sylvester Turner was a terrific state representative he really was he got a lot done he worked with people he's been an awful mayor just awful corruption, scandal of the week, and stuff wasn't getting done. <laughs> Our roads are, are worse than ever, so that's why I told Sheila, reject the endorsement, you don't want it. Uh, this, we need a strong IG, we need more money to the DA's office so they can start doing more work yeah, in this area. <laughs> Things are out of control and stuff isn't getting done, and I think people are fed up, and why I think the real argument for this runoff is, you like the way things have been the last eight years? You ought to vote for Sheila. Hey, we're going to vote. That's right. If you don't, oh, vote for Whitmire. We're going to vote for Paul Castro on this okay. in overtime. Still to come, <laughs> name-calling, rule-bending, and confrontation. The race to represent District D on City Council takes a nasty turn in Sunnyside. Well, to right, right. To choose to believe that bad behavior should right, be right. Uh, a reward. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. What about the issue, Council Member Shabazz? Go, go take what, your medication. What about? All right, just another fun-filled day at the Sunnyside polling place with District D challenger Travis McGee engaging not so positively with incumbent Carolyn Evans Shabazz. This week, the tension and daily verbal scrapping boiled over when multiple law enforcement units were dispatched to the precinct following a confrontation between Evans Shabazz and a precinct worker. When Fox 26 arrived, the council member denied any wrongdoing and claimed she's been targeted with harassment by McGee. He's called my workers crackheads, uh, all kinds of things. He's cursed me. He's cursed them. She's always playing the victim after she done things like that. 
You know, she, 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 she have done things like that to me. I've been accused of stuff that I never did. She's brought my family into this stuff also. Panel, no one ever said democracy wasn't messy, but this degree of behavior it's kind of the stuff of the elementary school playground, and sadly, it's hardly isolated. Bill, I've talked to you about uh, some of the things you've witnessed over the years. I. We live in I. I live in D. Okay. You go ahead. Okay. This is the district in which I live in, and I've lived in there for over 40 years. And this is the most heated race that we've had going back to Garnett Coleman and Judon Boney. Not Ada Edwards and Gerald Womack, because I told everybody in that particular race, Ada had done her field work and she would prevail. But he did this has been the most heated race. And I'm telling you all, the community is well divided, well divided. This is a race, I'm gonna tell y'all, I don't know who gonna win. Okay, let me, I let me tell you about hosting. I build to a crescendo, <laughs> that's why you were gonna be second, okay? <laughs> Bill King, now. Now you gotta go after that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I know both of them a little bit. I know Travis a little bit better. Travis is a barber out there and has a barber shop. I actually went out and got my hair cut during one of the campaigns. <laughs> Something I learned from Mickey Leland, if you want to know what's going on in the community, go get your hair cut right. at the local barber. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Travis has been an advocate for how terrible District D is treated, which it is absolutely sort of the stepchild, it and B both are, at the city of Houston. And so it'll be interesting to see if his, if his message resonates. I'm going to tell you what, if he were on council, it would be quite entertaining. All right, Paul Castro, yeah. what if we brought some of this video into one of your government classes at school? Well, I think that video and the tweet storm between Phelan and Patrick uh, are great <laughs> examples of this is broke. You know, we have a lot of things that are broken. But personally, I would rather those conversations be made out in public as they are. I think this is actually healthy for democracy. Could it be tweaked a little bit? Sure. But having people talk about the issues, as McGee was saying on video, uh, that should be happening. What Bill's saying, what Tamara's saying, those are both important. Uh, get out there, have the conversations. This is what I would do. And if it gets a little heated, it gets a little heated. I told McGee I would make it very clear that he was not in a physical confrontation with uh, Evan Shabazz. That was with a poll worker and they were pointing at each other. Holly, your thoughts here. Well, you know, as a student of history, this is nothing new. It happens. And then when you get closer to the end of a campaign season, people get pretty passionate and upset. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're, we'll continue to see that kind of thing. You would like to see the adults in the room have a conversation about policy. Some of us are actually still interested in the policies and uh, what we can do to make the community better rather than a lot of name calling. Gary, I'm guessing you're saying no news here. Move on. <laughs> well, uh, it, it's not a lot of a lot of news. What's interesting about the race is Shabazz is the incumbent, and she got pushed into a runoff. That mm -hmm. means she has political weakness, as Tamara has indicated. It's a pick 'em race, and I think it's clear that a significant number of voters in that district are not happy with the performance of the incumbent. So, if you aren't, vote her out and give someone else a chance. Bill, this ever happened to you? Quickly, <coughs> no. or your folks? <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anything. Well. There was some, there's always some harassment of poll workers sort of getting into it at the polls and stuff, but normally it's, you know, kind of childish stuff. But um, I thought one thing was interesting is, you know, you talked about law enforcement being there. They were there because Tanisha Hudspa called them out there, which is her protocol. Once she gets a complaint that poll workers are being harassed, she calls law enforcement, which is exactly the right thing. I think just another indication that she's really on top of doing her job. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. No one messes with tomorrow at the polls, I might add. <laughs> when we come back, launching campaign endorsements and attacks with Harris County resources. That's the clear-cut allegation against Judge Lena Hidalgo, and the proof is on video. I happen to know her opponent, Sean Tier. He is a well-respected, very experienced, uh, strong opponent who not only just released a poll showing that he's ahead, but he has severely outraised her. I literally spent the day yesterday before this stuff was leaked working on the endorsement of him on Monday. Oh my God. Whoops, Judge Lena Hidalgo blatantly campaigning for a Democratic ally on county property, as well as the taxpayer's dime and media platforms. And it was no slip up. In addition to campaigning for Mr. Tier, Hidalgo engaged in campaigning against sitting District Attorney Kim Ogg. 
she is the single biggest obstacle to smart public safety and fair criminal justice in Harris County. Good grief. Hidalgo went on to encourage Democratic precinct chairs to formally admonish Kim Ogg as she pursues re-election. Talk about your blatant violation of Texas ethics laws. Apparently, Houston attorney Mark McCaig felt the same way and filed a complaint with the state panel, as our good friend Holly Hansen has ably reported. Using an elected office to engage in political advertising is a crime in Texas, as is misuse of government property. Take it from there, Holly. Wow, I, you know, you have to wonder who vetted this speech that she made from county property and that was live streamed on county resources. Uh, so it was on the official county Ugh. judges' uh, tw <coughs> social media accounts. It was live streamed. They have taken it down. Mark McCaig files this complaint. The irony is that she had this press conference to respond to uh, new search warrants and to she and her staff regarding the COVID vaccine outreach contract. Um, this is pretty open and shut. Uh, there's a complaint pending with the Texas Ethics Commission, and now the Texas Rangers are all, all investigating this issue as well. Not hard to investigate this one. The evidence is right out there in public, including on the Fox 26 website. All right, Gary, if, if Hidalgo at, called and asked for uh, legal advice on this, uh, uh, what would it be? Does that look pretty blatant? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Right. Don't talk. <laughs> You're just digging yourself in a hole. So look, she's going to get it. I think. I still think she's getting indicted on the first case. I think she's going to get indicted on this one. She didn't do Sean Tier any favors. I, I, I think I, I would say she's misrepresenting the facts. I guarantee you, she doesn't know Sean Tier from Adam. They have met him once, uh, and you know he's a, he was a good prosecutor. Uh, but Kim's got a record she can run on, uh, and the criticism is that she wasn't left-wing enough on crime prevention and, and that she tries to enforce ethics laws that the voters say they want to see done so she, you know she is beyond a joke at this point she really needs to just go away all right we've, permanently. Got, some, we've got some results from our sunday survey and 93 percent of you say just enforce the laws we have there you, you agree with that bill yes <laughs> <laughs> you know what i find amazing about this the more i hear hidalgo talk the more she sounds like Donald Trump to me. I mean, it, yeah. yes. I mean, let's attack the prosecutors. Yes. Let's yes. I mean, Which yeah. hunt? You know, yeah. yeah. It's just, you know, I'm, being, I'm being persecuted. Yes. And then let's go out and get your the, the prosecutor who's prosecuting you and your staff. Let's go make sure they get unelected mm -hmm. and replaced so with somebody away. that will dismiss all these charges against exactly. me and my staff. I mean, Come on, this is just Okay, but absurd. Kim didn't investigate her. The Texas Rangers, That's true. R A N G E R S, <laughs> who works for A B B O T T. <laughs> That's who investigated you. Not Kim. They did. They the ones found the crime. They the ones said you should be in that. What is wrong with you? It wasn't her. And I did not see this video, girl. I didn't see this video. <laughs> I'm just seeing it for the first time. You have lost your mind. You cannot use county dollars to get up there and before like you did and whoever said it was okay for you to say that they lied to you all right Paul Castro jump in here yeah I'm <laughs> beyond disappointed uh, my experience with Hidalgo is one where she says one thing and does another uh, you know my daughter uh, and I went to an event and Hidalgo came with a camera and that was the only real time she ever paid attention to the the situation that involved crime I, I think that a lot of the things that involve crime locally are being uh, pushed under the rug and be, and we're being told like this isn't a thing, this isn't a thing. Bill took my line. I think she's behaving more like Donald Trump. I think she's trying to stop the prosecution mm -hmm. but through political effort and I think that's wrong and the city of Houston and Harris County deserve better. All right, Holly, let's go back quickly to the precinct chairs. Uh, that's moving, that process is moving forward, right? Right, so the, the Democratic Party here in Harris County is looking at passing a resolution that admonishes Kim Ogg um, it's not a censure, so they're trying to say it's kind of a milder way of saying they don't approve of her policies. It very narrowly passed their steering committee last night and will be taken up by the full complement of the Democrat Party chairs, uh, I think, uh, in a week or so. Um, but, it, you know, part of the complaint is that she's willing to investigate elected officials who happen to be members of her own party, which 
Kim August, the chief law enforcement officer of Harris County, we would want anyone in that position to pursue corruption wherever it is. All right, you know, Gary says, if I can agree with people on 80 or 90 percent of stuff, they're my ally. I can, I can figure it out. We're going to talk more in the next segment, okay? Still to come, young American voters appear to be abandoning President Joe Biden. Is it just temporary or a potential roadblock for re-election? But up next, fresh grand jury activity related to the bid-rigging prosecution of three senior aides to County Judge Lena Hidalgo. What, if anything, does it mean? Bills. Welcome back. After months of relative dormancy, the bid rigging case against a trio of senior aides to Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo rumbling to life once again. As most of you will recall, three weeks ago, the Texas Rangers obtained a fresh batch of search warrants targeting encrypted messages exchanged and potentially deleted by the defendants and unindicted players connected to this alleged scheme. This week, we learned prosecutors sought and obtained superseding indictments related to the existing felony charge of misuse of official information. Panel, I'm going to bring up the issue of timing. That is, the Democratic primary for district attorney is exactly Exactly four months away. Does that tough play in here, you think, Holly? <laughs> Who knows? I mean, you know, the thing is, everybody's been wondering what's going on with these cases, right? And then all of a sudden we have these new search warrants. Uh, they are executed, I think, although one of the indicted staffers, Alex Triantaphilis, tried to quash these uh, new search warrants saying that, uh, you know, you don't need any new information. You have everything you need. But apparently we're looking at possible destruction of evidence. Um, these new charges are interesting. Um, and uh, I think I think that uh, there could be more indictments you know just talking to some of the people on this scene here but uh, clearly part of what happened with Lena Hidalgo in the past few weeks was to try to get out in front of this issue uh, and pl place a target on Kim Og right before her primary quickly if it can be proven that Hidalgo staffers actually deleted government records which is the communications is that a crime yes <laughs> That's obstruction of destruction of government documents and it's obstruction of justice. So, look, uh, they're 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 doing their research. They're getting their all their acts and lines in a row, so they can go to trial. So there's more and new information in this case. It's it's fascinating, uh, and I do anticipate Lena's getting indicted. I think that's why she got out and tried to tried to finesse this, and why she's actively campaigning for Kim's opponent because she hopes he'll win the primary, and if he wins the general, he'll dismiss all the cases as a political favor to her. 20 seconds. All right. Uh, yes, I was, like everybody else, wondering what was going on with this because we hadn't heard anything for months. And I'm telling you all that these new indictments coming out, you know, they wanted to see what was on those WhatsApp apps because they couldn't see them before, but now they can, and I expect new indictments are going to come out. But what I think they're really looking for is to see who orchestrated all of this because, you see, I don't know, last thing I heard before she became county judge was she worked at a Starbucks or something. But anyway, they want to see who led this. Who led this? How do we get to this? That's what they're looking for. 30 seconds. Yeah, so we haven't seen the indictments yet, so we don't know exactly. But it's hard to imagine they don't relate to the search warrants and, and probably going back and filling additional factual allegations about what they found as a result of the search warrants, which appears to be that a lot of messages were intentionally deleted. All right, we're going to leave it there. Well, one quick point. We still haven't gotten our money back, all of it. Right. Not Chris all Hollins, of it. where's our money? Right, here we go. The con man turned congressman first exposed and now permanently expelled from the House of Representatives. The latest chapter in the sordid tale of George Santos. George Santos violated not only the rules of the House, but every moral standard that this House has ever had and that the integrity and the reputation of this House are being denigrated every single day that George Santos is here. By a vote of 311 to 114, the U.S. House of Representatives has expelled 35-year-old George Santos from Congress. The grifter turned lawmaker faces a variety of federal charges, including fraud, money laundering, and theft. And despite overwhelming evidence of felonious wrongdoing, new House Speaker Mike Johnson and Houston area Congressman Troy Nels were among Republicans voting against removal from office. Kicking out Mr. Santos is setting a very dangerous precedent. 
Never before has Congress expelled a member based on indictments. Panel, I'd say we are pretty familiar with that argument here in the Lone Star State, given the recent Paxton impeachment. That said, the vote here was pretty overwhelming, with more than 100 Republicans bucking House leadership on this. Paul Castro, what do you make of this? I think uh, we all owe a debt of gratitude to George Santos. Uh, not everyone can be an astronaut, but anybody can be a House of Representatives. <laughs> um, he's lowered the bar so far. Uh, and, and if he weren't so dumb, I think he probably would have gotten away with it. He but the would. audaciousness of yes. what he did, the fact that he had held on to credit card numbers and yes. was rebilling people for things yes. and then spending it on pornographic sites. Ooh. I mean, just, Botox. it's, it's, yeah, Botox. and. It's unbelievable, but at the same time, it helps, I think, everyone feel a little bit better about themselves. Yeah. All right, uh, here, let's go to the argument made by some of the Republicans. You know, clearly they have a razor-thin uh, advantage in the House, uh, but this whole, uh, there's not enough here yet to, to kick him out, Bill. Well, you know, you should have said pathological grifter, which is what he really is. It's unbelievable. And look, he needed to go for sure, but I do understand the argument that you haven't kicked anybody out based on indictment. And when you go over to the Senate and look at Mendez, frankly accused of much more serious conduct relating directly to national security, and he's still on the Intelligence Committee, and he's still receiving briefings, and not even talk about kicking him out. So it is, I do understand the argument, it's a double standard. I do understand the argument that, you know, should we kick people out? based on just indictments and not actual convictions. But this conduct was so egregious. Exactly. I think everybody just kind of went, sorry, Go ahead, buddy. Yeah. Listen, the fact that this guy said, yes, I know I told you I was Jewish. I meant I was Jewish-like. Uh, and then the Republican Jew guy, yeah, Jew <laughs> yes. And then the Republican guy who said he had divorced himself from reality. It is very difficult. I don't care what your margin is. You don't want Boo Boo the Fool to be your excuse for having a better margin. He needed to go. This guy doesn't care about anything. He was engaged to a woman and pretended to be one. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's too confusing. So, no, he needed to go. All right, Holly, you know. The gift that keeps on giving you were to Democrats. Yeah. Holly, you were troubled by the lack of due process in the Texas House. Yeah. Is this equivalent? No. Yeah, I, well, no. I think there are some similarities. Now, Santos is in a category all of his own. I mean, you just can't even make this stuff up. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting to see uh, John Fetterman of Pennsylvania come out and be kind of a voice of reason on this and say, okay, what are we doing about Mendez, right. who I was yeah. convicted not just indicted and there are other sitting members of Congress and uh, sitting members of other legislative bodies who have some very serious ethical problems criminal problems etc and uh, you know let's let's raise the standard all right, final 25 seconds to you. Yeah, I think that it's, there, there is a double standard. Mendez is going to be left alone till he is, if and when he is convicted. He hadn't been convicted yet, just charged. He was previously convicted and he was acquitted. Uh, Santos is a, a total and complete fraud. Absolutely, he was an embarrassment. Uh, but changing the standard means it's a new standard. So I think everybody needs to understand that when a Democratic House member acts uh, that mm -hmm. way and is lying and making stuff up and commits fraud, then they need to go too. You can't have this one way for Republicans and one way for Democrats. Hear, hear. When we come back, a staggering number of younger voters appear to be abandoning Joe Biden. With the election just 11 months away, Democrats... Welcome back. A pair of national polls have generated some head-snapping results. A New York Times survey of voters 30 and younger showed Biden tied with Donald Trump at 30 percent and behind independent Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who attracted 34 percent. That result on top of an earlier Emerson poll, which found 45 percent of those 30 and younger backing Trump, with Biden attracting 43 percent. Panel in the last presidential election, Mr. Biden pulled in better than 60 percent of the so-called youth vote. What is going on here, Paul? Yeah, there's a great book by an author named Yasha Munk called The Identity Trap. And what he talks about is this idea of intersectionality, which is if you agree with me on topic A, so for example, uh, Black Lives Matter, you also have to agree with me on all of these other factors. Uh, I see this right now. So in talking with young people, people who are in their 18s, you know, 18 to 25, um, they know 
very little about the Jewish position of about what's happening right now uh, overseas. And instead, they are entirely informed by what they see on TikTok. And that's largely because they've been convinced that if I agree with my friends on these social issues over here, I also have to support what's happening with Palestine, therefore Hamas, and be anti-Israeli. And they're equating Israel with being oppressors. And I... I, I don't understand how that is true, and it's true. All right. Uh, I interviewed uh, House Foreign Affairs Chairman Michael McCall, who suggested there is a coordinated social media effort uh, on TikTok uh, and other platforms by the Russians, the Iranians, and the Chinese. Uh, and this is part of it. It's been successful. Uh, Gary, I'm sure you want to talk about this. Yeah, it also involves uber leftists like George Soros who are helping fund these allegedly spontaneous protests. They're not. They're all organized. So yeah, that's they're telling a story because and there's and there's agendas all over the place. Why does Russia want this to be told? Well, because they want to distract uh, the American people and the American policyholders from dealing with the Ukraine war. So there's an agenda everywhere. But uh, it's, it's not true, and I will tell you, uh, I was at a meeting this week, and, and nationally the Jewish community is, is getting their act together. They were not playing in social media. They, were, they weren't doing things they needed to do, kind of like uh, Israel going to sleep at the border and That's thinking right. they were just interested in uh, economic prosperity and working to attack. Uh, it's 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 tough, and and the war is going to continue, and and Biden is going to continue to get garbage, and and I anticipate uh, that they'll, you'll continue to hear positive rhetoric from both Israel and the United States about what happens, and the behind the scenes pressure is going to be ignored by Israel because if they don't, their country is going to be destroyed. <coughs> I got 15 seconds. You want it? Uh, listen, I don't think Biden needs to worry about it. One thing I understand about young people because I'm around them a lot, they got the attention span of a gnat. So <laughs> don't worry about that. But that's 11 months away. They, the, the next Taylor Swift concert or Beyonce album come out, they're going to change the page. So look, don't don't worry about that. And I absolutely believe what you're saying about the social media, that they are taking this uh, the, the uh, algorithms and making them the way they want them. All right, we're leaving it there. Up next, capitalizing 187 years of turbulent Texas history in just 13 taxpayer-funded pages. While critics label it propaganda, backers call it the 1836 Project. On tonight's edition of Texas, the issue is airing at 945 right here on Fox 26. We examine the 1836 project, an effort by the Republican-controlled legislature to present a capsulized portrait celebrating our state's evolution. No surprise, critics are calling the historical pamphlet a whitewash. I think that, in fact, this is more about telling a common story. This is just getting people reconnected. We don't want to be ahistorical. Now, we also don't want to be the people that tell you what your history is. We can't do that. You know what your history is, but it needs to be an informed understanding of your history. Panel, what do you make of this effort? Is it really impossible, as some suggest, to generate a basic primer on the past 187 years? Holly? Yeah. You, can, you can construct a basic primer. When you get deeper into historical study, and I, I studied history and at the graduate school level, um, you know, there's always going to be these contrasting interpretations, but when you're talking about general information, what you teach to your students at a younger age, you try to be a little bit more neutral, but inevitably, history, it, it is biased by nature. Um, they start us off in history. I, I studied medieval history. You read two lives of Charlemagne from two different perspectives, and one you know, is almost like a hagiography, and the other is just, oh, he's the worst person ever. I mean, that's, that's always going to be that dynamic where you're trying to sort it out. I think it's important to teach history more so than uh, teaching what we've transcended to uh, uh, social studies, but actual history, and, and people should know how we got to where we are. It makes for uh, better civic involvement and better awareness and better understanding of how the world works. You know, I said tonight, uh, you know, we taped this earlier, I said, you know, Texas history will never be a group hug. Never. I mean, <laughs> Ever. No, Ever. So, no Ever. history is. Yeah, no, 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 right. no, it's right. It's right. right. Some say the Crusaders were the first mob. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so. All right. Thanks to this week's panel, and thank you for joining us. The conversation continues on a national level next on Fox News Sunday with Shannon Bream. And we'll keep talking here with Watch Your Point Overtime streaming live on fox26houston.com and on our Facebook page. Now look, everybody, you can vote today early afternoon and vote early through to Tuesday. Seven. If you watch this show and you don't vote, shame on you.